Welcome to the Wire Card Saga, Season 3 Lies, Spies, and Corporate Crimes. Mikhail Ryder Gordon, Managing Director of Institutional Ethics and Integrity at Affiliated Monitors. Over this podcast series, we're going to take a deep dive into the Wire Card Saga to see where it may take us literally across the globe. The Wire Card Saga is a production of the award winning Compliance Podcast Network. Thanks, Tom. Listeners, welcome to episode 36 of Lies, Spies, and Corporate Crimes, The Wirecard Saga. I'm going to call this episode Blunt Force Trauma. After some of the recent episodes, Darkness, I thought, let's turn to something lighter, cheerier, like espionage and treason. Whilst the Braun et al. trial in Germany has been underway, Austria has been having a bit of a, call it a reconciliation of its own with respect to Wirecard and its Austrian former executives. As with so much involving Wirecard, we've got to go back to the past for a moment and then we'll get current with events in Austria. Now, no doubt, because you are the savviest of listeners and like tugging that yarn that helps us unravel the Wirecard sweater, you'll recall back at the beginning of the summer of 2020, 22, about half a year ago, more than, Demasi and Macrum's breathless coverage of an alleged sighting of Jan Marsalek in Moscow. References were made knowingly about how Marsalek was seen with his new girlfriend, Anna. How do you know she's new? Maybe she's been with him for years. After all, at least travel-wise, Jan started hanging out in bear country at least as far back as 2007. This is the guy the waggers of tongues have claimed kept a drawer full of pre-wrapped gifts from Tiffany to keep his German girlfriend slash fiancé happy every time he missed an event or forgot a birthday. Let's be honest, folks. If you have a partner or significant other or even a regular booty call who actually anticipates needing to bestow gifts as forgive-me bribes for failing to show up, Is it really so much of a stretch to imagine same said person may have another partner somewhere else? Imagine how thrilled Jan's former fiancé must be to learn he's found peace in a new relationship. Actually, thinking about it, maybe she's ecstatic with relief. Now maybe half a dozen intelligence agencies will stop listening to her phone calls and monitoring her bank accounts. Hell, maybe Marsalek has an entire family in Moscow. One can just imagine the squeals from the punters when Marsalek is sighted in Moscow, wrestling the baby seat into the back of the Audi 8. Why is spotting Marsalek in Moscow in any way surprising? The guy is a traitor to both his home country and his former adoptive country, Germany. Does it really matter what his motivations were for selling his countries out? Was it ideological or was it expediency? Was it genuine belief or was it money? Who gives a shite? It makes no difference that Philby supposedly did what he did in a fervent belief he was combating fascism or that Blunt was swayed by Burgess whilst selling out his country. I happen to buy some books belonging to the former surveyor of the Queen's pictures. Really, his Mellon lectures on Poussin, the artist of the masterful work, Dance to the Music of Time, Also, Anthony Powell's brilliantly comic epic book series remains definitive. But I digress, I'm sorry, because treason isn't funny at all. If you think Marsalek as a Russian asset wasn't planned all along, it is useful to remember that before the official meltdown of Wirecard, as Jan was still telling investors all of this was just a big misunderstanding, Nine days before he would flee Germany and Austria, Marsalek was granted Russian citizenship. (laughs) Talk about fast-tracking immigration. And was issued a Russian passport under the name German Bajanov. That's right. He already had the escape plan in place, thanks to his Russian handlers who expedited delivery of a Russian passport under a new name that wouldn't trigger alerts. On June 10th, 2021, Marsalek acquired Russian citizenship. 
along with yet another Russian passport. More on that evolution. Further connections to Russian use of chemical weapons. Novichok. Yes, there actually is yet another connection. And life as a Russian tool. Next episode. We don't care why Marsalek felt compelled to perpetrate such catastrophic damage upon Austria, and particularly upon the Austrian intelligence service, the former BVT. Yes, I said former. <clears throat> why? Because the damage wrought, well, is that ROT? <laughs> On the credibility of the BVT, an infiltration so extensive, the only thing to do was burn it down and build again. Metaphorically, that is. The Austrian government was compelled to dissolve the entire bloody agent and create a new one. The Directorate for State Protection and Intelligence Security, or the DSN. Now, one would think a good house cleaning at the BVT would have effectively taken the traitors out with the trash. But it rather appears that whilst the name has changed. The DSN may still house some untrustworthy intelligence officers and be dallying with those more closely aligned with another country's security services. Marsalek and his BVT buddies left some unexploded ordnance behind when they departed. Marsalek may have put his tail between his legs and beat a cowardly retreat to Moscow whilst the likes of Weiss and Schellenbacher and Ott squirm in Austrian custody. But the damage is still being uncovered. So where are things now? The new security agency, the DSN, was established to restore trust, of, particularly of other cooperating intelligence agencies. Think those of Austria's European counterparts and the US, and you get the idea. And Austria's citizens, because let's face it, after the BVT scandals of the last couple of years, you remember, allegations of corruption, nepotism, leaks, former employees of the BVT on the payroll of Marsalek, leaking to him classified information about people and strategies. The list does run on nexus to various political scandals, including the one touching Kurtz. Okay, so investigations by the public prosecutor in Vienna are still ongoing. But because of this, effectively, the BVT was sidelined internationally. So the Austrian government formed the new agency and issued a press release at its launch, <clears throat> saying Austria wanted its intelligence agency to be, quote, trustworthy, <clears throat> internationally networked and reliable. Listeners, if you somehow miss the drama involving the BVT and Wirecard, go back to episodes 12, 15, 17, 26, 30. I think there are more, but uh, that'll start you. But no sooner was the new agency created, cracks began to show, or rather some of that ordinance started exploding. It began to come to light that several companies awarded contracts by the new DSN appeared to be led by some of the very same people that helped destroy the BVT from within and who hold deep ties back to Marsalek and to Russia. As if that weren't enough, these same companies were tasked with providing critical services to the new DSN. And I don't mean running the commissary or supplying stationery. Remember Marsalek's buddy, Wolfgang Gattringer? This was the guy who, from 2003 to 2007, was deputy head of cabinet in the Federal Ministry of the Interior, they responsible for the oversight of the BVT, now DSN, Gatringer was tied to Marsalek's hijinks in the Near East involving the Russian mercenary force Wagner Group. His company, Gatringer's, not Marsalek's, Repuco, they were the ones that began back in March 2016 to regularly provide Marsalek with that chick market analysis of Russia for a minimum 7,000 euros a month. Remember, remember Killian Kleinschmidt, goodness, body cams, Colonel Andre Shuprijan and the business ties and visits to Russia? Yeah, yeah, see, it's all coming back to now. Okay, in July 2021, Gatringer engages in an unusual corporate merger rebrand, transforming his company Repuco into part of a new entity, Message Plot Austria GmbH. 
I'll just call them message plot. Gatringer remained on board as a, quote, member of the management team, according to the press release. And then, only a few weeks after that corporate rebrand, in August of 21, the newly formed DSN awards message plot and another company, Rise GmbH, some very large contracts. More on Rise in a moment. Message Plot is to provide consulting and support services to the DSN for the construction and operation of high security networks for this new intelligence agency. Basically, the Austrian Interior Ministry that Gatringer used to help head commissioned these two companies, one of which Gatringer is part owner of, to set up the critical infrastructure of Austria's new secret service that he, Gatringer, with Marsalek's help, had helped burn down. Now, also over at Message Plot is a buddy of Gatringer's and Marsalek's, Wolfgang Vosenkrantz, another former managing director of Repuco, and according to his profile, now director of e-procurement and public-private projects at Message Plot. He wears two hats, but we're coming to that. So far, so conflict of interest. Ah, what's a little procurement corruption amongst friends, right? Now, Research Industrial Systems Engineering, RISE, the other company awarded contracts by the DSN, is an IT R&D group headquartered in Schwerwischat with offices, branches, and subsidiaries throughout Austria, Germany, Switzerland, France, the UAE, and India. 100% Austrian privately owned. RISE worked with Wirecard back before the great corporate tumble. Is there anybody who hasn't? RISE was created as a spin-off of TU Vienna. And the CEO of RISE, Thomas Greschenig, frequently emailed back and forth with Marsalek. For years, they were buddies. In fact, one Austrian news outlet, BR Research, identified at least 300 emails between Groschetik and Marsalek. Now, interestingly, in mid-2016, RISE partnered with Wirecard to bid on a contract for a ticket and billing system for a local public transport system in St. Petersburg. Now we get to fast forward to 2022. A few months ago, the Austrian Parliament began looking into the how and what of these DSN-awarded critical cybersecurity contracts to rise and message plot, those from back in August of 21. Collectively, these companies had been tasked by the Austrian Government Computer Emergency Response Team for Public Administration, as a mouthful, GovCert as they're known, with providing the Austrian Federal Chancellery with backup servers and operational incident handling of cyber threats and cybersecurity to the DSN. In other words, for those of you who aren't very tech savvy, they handed the keys to the digital kingdom over all of the electronic data, the head of the Austrian government and its intelligence agency, sends and receives, and they handed those keys to Rise and Message Plot. Message Plot was to provide services for, quote, project controlling for ITC high security networks. Rise was awarded a significantly larger order, about one and a half, 1.4 million euros, for the construction and operation of high security networks for the DSN. And rather conveniently, Rosenkranz left Repuco, newly rechristened message plot, to be hired as an authorized signatory at the newly founded GovCert in July 2021, just one month before the DSN awarded the contract to his very recent former employer. Not only are these companies led by buddies of Jan Marsalek's, Gatringer, Rosenkrantz, and Krishenig, both Rise and Message Plot, neighbor Puko, had maintained tight business relationships with Wirecard for quite a number of years. In fact, both companies 
didn't just maintain tight business relationships with Wirecard. Both companies also lead straight back to Russian armament companies. And because you can't make this stuff up when it's involving Wirecard, Rise is tied to a Russian company that actually lists its corporate headquarters as a local discotheque. <laughs> yeah, like I said, you can't make this up if it's Wirecard. See, it transpires the partner company of Rise and Wirecard in that St. Petersburg bid with Skytech. And Skytech is the sister company of Rostec. And go back to episode 23 if you've forgotten how Rostec fits in here. Rostec, one of Russia's largest military armaments companies, yes, they've been on the sanctions list since Russia invaded the Crimea in 2014, and thanks to the invasion of Ukraine, have struggled to roll off that naughty list. Skytech's headquarters... Yes, they're the ones working out of, you can't make this up, a disco in Dimitrograd. In Dimitrograd. <laughs> okay, hold on. I have to stop laughing here for a moment about the disco. Okay. Back in 2015, right after Skytech is formed, Wirecard agreed a contract with them to sell software to a third company, an IRS, another subsidiary of Rostec. Unfortunately for them, some compliance officers were actually paying attention and the sale proceeds couldn't be paid directly due to those pesky sanctions. So, the four million wire card was set to be paid from didn't come from NIRS or Rostec, but had to be run through Skytech in order to evade sanction. Now, RISE wasn't just linked to Skytech. It was also involved in another Marsalic-driven project known as Amima. Back in the fall of 2016, Marsalic's buddy CEO of Rise, Grishenig, actually gave a presentation to Wirecard's management board that demonstrated it had developed a concept to guide and track refugee flows from Libya. Grishenig bragged in this email about their software, that it, quote, if necessary, could track any individual and identify them throughout Europe with this, quote, tool. Just, it can rapidly interpret data across several million users. And they can even house, he said, a data center in Europe. If so, now, RISE is believed to have generated a turnover about 1.3 million euros with projects for Wirecard between 2014 and 2017. But when asked by the Austrian Interior Ministry during the DSN bidding process if they'd ever had any connection to Wirecard, Rise responded, there was no information to report. <laughs> you want to rethink that answer? In the most recent inquiries, just this past couple of months, the Austrian Parliament asked GovCert and the DSN, <clears throat> ahem. Did RISE know about this relationship with Rostec when it partnered with Skytech? Now, Gatringer, he of Repuco now message plot, had bragged in an email to Marsalik that he and the company at that time, and I'm going to say probably still, held a, quote, particularly long-term relationships with many decision makers in Russia. And the technology RISE was suggesting be implemented for tracking immigrants? That brings in a third company with connections to Marsalik and Marcus Braun. More on that one in a moment. As so eloquently stated by David Strogmuller, member of the Green Party and the Austrian National Council, during the December 2022 parliamentary sessions only a couple of weeks ago, these connections between Russia, Gatringer, Message Plot, Neighbor Puko, Rise, and Marsalik, they pose, quote, a huge problem for Austria and Austria's intelligence partners like Germany and the EU and the U US. He went on to say, quote, Marsalik is in contact with Russia. Yes, David, he resides there. With secret services in Russia. Yeah, again, David. And to hire someone here, Austria, for the development of this sensitive infrastructure in an Austrian secret service who was in the pay of Marsala, it is, quote, simply inconceivable and absolutely needs to be cleared up. I do love a good understatement, don't you? 
Strogmuller also demanded clarification from the DSN. Quote, if these companies have been engaged, they must have been subject to a background check. No? He asked. He couldn't conceal his surprise that the DSN either hadn't conducted one or dug deeper or, and then it hits him in the hearing, quote, the alternative entered into it quite deliberately. Austrian Bundestag member Konstantin von Notz, who chairs the Parliamentary Control Committee responsible for the intelligence services, he also expressed some minor irritation. <laughs> Can't imagine why. Now let's pause for a moment, because I mentioned a third company with ties to both the DRN and Marsalek and Braun. And recall the type of tool that Grishenig bragged about in his email to Marsalek in terms of how to track these refugees. Okay. The Austrian media outlet Focus, published back in 2021, a story about Marsalek and another software company he was involved with that turned out also to be have, well, ties to Russia. Are we all surprised at this juncture? Okay. Now, Focus had surfaced an email from late August 2018 from an Austrian political string puller and advisor, air quotes on advisor, to the then Austrian ruling party, the FPO, Florian Sternman. Sturman sent to Marsalek, oh, and I should add, Sturman was Secretary General of the Russian-Austrian Friendship Society. Too many episodes to, to remind you to go listen to on that one. And was heavily involved in, more quotes, the global financial industry at the time he sent this email to Marsalek. Now, more on that last bit about his ties to the financial industry. Okay. Sturman's email to Marsalek all those years ago contained a PDF attachment. The PDF was a 23-page company presentation from DSR, Decision Supporting Information Research Forensic, GmbH, DBA, DSERF. Now, DSERF is owned by Peter Dietenberger a German national who maintains homes in Austria and Switzerland, as well as Germany. And for European companies that wanted to do business in Russia before they invaded the Ukraine, he was long considered particularly valuable because Dietenberger's friends and acquaintances, they're part of the highest political echelon of Russia. In fact, his visa even identifies him as a guest of Putin's. And what are DSERF's offerings? According to the PDF presentation in that email from Sturman to Marsalek, DSERF was peddling a state-of-the-art computer monitoring tool. But it didn't stop there. DSERF boasted it could give its users, private or public, quote, full control over target computers and complete access to all passwords. It was suggested that their software could provide, say, governments with all the data they need for seamless surveillance. Now, this goes right back to that refugee immigration topic Marsalek and Gatringer were always so keen on. But they also went beyond that. DSERF bragged they have on staff at that time 30 highly trained employees with expertise in data theft, information warfare techniques, and influencing political campaigning. In a separate six-minute video entitled Biometric Recognition that was posted on DSERF's site, DSERF offered a world of total surveillance. DSERF suggests its software can pull surveillance footage from train stations, airports, department stores, shopping malls, street corners, restaurants, and feed it back into DSERF's data center. From there, the company combines biometric information with data it has scraped from social networks, criminal records, consumer habits from credit card payments, 
and payment information, like the kind Wirecard and its various partners collected, and continuously build and evolve profiles of targets, perfect for blackmailing or turning informants. According to one of DSERF's company videos, their biometric recognition software can scan the face of any target person across 2,000 different data points. Now, Dietenberger, the man with the best connections in the Kremlin, led a company that could orchestrate targeted hacker attacks in the West and access extensive data sets on millions of passers-by from video cameras. It's right up there with that software like the Pegasus, only that one was for deploying on mobiles. The kind that Pegasus or DSERF's peddling, it's the kind of thing that gets turned against human rights lawyers, investigative journalists like Khashoggi, and that certain governments like to use to repress their... Now, the PDF Sturman sent to Marsalek included a kind of customer or reference list. Look what all the people are saying about us. Five-star ratings. Among those on the list, the managing director of the Committee on Eastern European Economic Relations and that lovable launderer, Dimitri Furt. Trust me, I'd love to introduce some new faces into this story, but Wirecard makes it impossible. Of course, Furtosh came back. What makes the connection between Dietenberger, Deserf, Sturman, and Marsalek even more suspect are additional connections to Braun and Russian intelligence, political corruption, and Wirecard and its executives' nexus to all of it. Let's do another quick trip to the past and we'll come back to the present. Supposedly, about five years ago, Deserf was brought in as a subcontractor by its own auditor, KPMG. <laughs> Seriously, folks, what the hell? During a cybersecurity check at depart German department store Karstadt. Remember, DSERF says they can scrape data from surveillance cameras at department stores. Okay, and payment information, all right, to build their profiles. German and Austrian listeners may remember back in 2014, Karstadt, a little on rocky financial ground, had been bought out and taken over by none other than Austrian investor René Benko, using his holding company, Signa Holding, which you know, had already held a majority of car stats, so we might as well just buy it outright. It was losing money. Okay, so KPMG brings DSERF into Benko's car stat, and that's okay, because it turns out Dietenberger of DSERF is bodies with Benko of Signa. Signa includes remnants of car stat, Karfhoff and the Kadeve department stores in Berlin, and Benko is Austria's mega millionaire real estate empire king. And separately, Signa did confirm a contractual relationship with DSERF. So next time you're at the shopping mall of <laughs> the, the department store, keep that in mind. Anyway, then last summer, July 27th, 2022, to be precise, in written testimony, Kristen Flynn Goodwin, general manager and associate general counsel with Microsoft, told the U.S. House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence Hearings on combating the threats to U.S. national security for the proliferation of foreign commercial spyware, that was the name of the hearing, little unwieldy, I know, that it, Microsoft, had disrupted the tools of yet another Private Sector Offensive Actor, or PSOA. I should just call them, uh, okay, POS, no, PSOA, that they were calling Knotweed. Knotweed is the name Microsoft gave to DSERF. Microsoft's Threat Intelligence Center found the sub-zero malware being deployed through a variety of methods, including zero-day exploits in Windows and Adobe Reader, in 21 and 2022, and Microsoft's Threat Intelligence Center found multiple links between DSERF and the sub-zero exploits and malware being used in these attacks. The attacks included command and control infrastructure used by the malware directly, linking it back to DSERF, a DSERF-associated GitHub account being used in one attack, a code signing certificate issued to DSERF being used to sign an exploit, and another open source news report attributing Sub-Zero to DSERF. 
all you InfoSec listeners, remember you had to scramble earlier in 2022 to quickly patch that Microsoft flaw that Sub-Zero exploited? You know the one I'm talking about. Victims included law firms, banks, strategic consultancies, and countries such as Austria, the UK, even Panama. So DSERF, being an Austrian company owned by an Austrian national, the Austrian Interior Ministry, with oversight of the DRN, opened an investigation. Now this is where we take another current turn. We'll come back into the present. As the Austrian parliament was investigating the compromise of the DSN and the connection its vendors had to Marsalik and Russia, the European Committee of Inquiry of the European Parliament was looking into that controversial spy software Pegasus in the EU. In the discussions, DSERF's name popped up because of the Microsoft testimony to the US in July. Sub-Zero was used against targets in Austria and abroad without the consent of those affected. Based on a statement of facts by the Data Protection Association Epicenter Works to the Austrian Public Prosecutor's Office, it's believed that several criminal offenses were committed over a period of several years thanks to access from surreptitious planting of Sub-Zero. And it wasn't until July 2022 that Microsoft made that patch available for the various vulnerabilities in the Windows OS that was being exploited by the Sub-Zero software. Actually, they're still being patched by Windows users around the world. Austrian parliamentarians went to the Federal Ministry of the Interior and said, we know spy software like Sub-Zero is regularly used against human rights activists, journalists, members of the opposition in authoritarian regimes like, say, Saudi Arabia or Hungary or Rwanda or Morocco. Pick one. And we'd like some answers because it would appear that somehow DSERF is being used against our own people as well. And, said the parliamentarians, we know from Microsoft, who told us directly that DSERF used its spy software against at least one Austrian law firm, which, without their knowledge, was definitely not legal under Austrian law. So, we assume that DSERF's other national and international activities also require a legal review. Furthermore, we know DSERF has connections to Russia, and we have reason to believe DSERF is connected to Marsalik. Against this background, it would rather appear that investigation would be indispensable and time critical. Now, just so listeners not based in Europe understand, under EU law, there is no legal basis for unauthorized use of monitoring software by public institutions. And it is really unlawful for private companies to use software against another private company in the EU. And the making and deploying of zero-day attacks and other forms of malware? That's just a no-no everywhere. Epicenter filed a criminal complaint against DSERF with the Vienna Public Prosecutor's Office, accusing it of hacking, production of malware, data processing misuse. So we still have that case to, to watch and see what comes out of Even the Austrian Federal Ministry of Labor and the Economy acknowledged to Parliament that no export license for DSERF had ever been granted. The Ministry of Justice weighed in and said, yeah, we're all over this criminal investigation into DSERF. And now the Austrian Parliament has hearings on the company and its connections. As the most recent questions posed by members of the Austrian Parliament asked, against the backdrop of the business relations with Russia that have now become public, this raises some serious concerns about the full functioning and independence of the new DSN. We're demanding these companies and this situation be urgently reviewed. Let's face it, they want reassurance that Austria's security interests, their intelligence services, only newly formed, are protected from Russian influence and that there is adequate protection against the outflow of sensitive information to Russia, the kind that comes with exploits and malware and, oh yeah, that's right, and a couple of companies that are running the systems for DSN. I think that pony left the barn quite a few years ago. Hey, Austria. Moreover, they pondered out loud in these hearings, if Germany and Austria are sharing intelligence with Russia, huh, other countries in the EU and maybe Five Eyes, they may not be impressed, huh? Maybe they'll stop sharing again. Uh Uh-oh. But perhaps the question posed by one of the parliamentarians sums it up best. 
What exactly is the Ministry of the Interior doing to present, prevent DSERF from hacking into others? And just how much damage has this done to Austrian diplomatic relations with other countries? Yeah, nothing says cybersecurity like a Russian link companies that are offering IT consulting services and software development to your national intelligence agency. DSERF brags of providing political interference, and RISE builds itself as a builder of software for industrial uses, industrial control systems, which include supervisory control and data acquisitions systems, you know the Mascatas, distributed control systems, and other control system configurations such as programmable logic controllers, PLCs. You have to be an IT geek to get into this stuff. Often found, where do you find this stuff? In the industrial control sectors, they're the systems that regulate power grids or keep the uh, lights on. Ask the Ukrainians about their experience with SCADAs and the Russians, circa 2014. Oh, and golly, I nearly forgot. We need to come back to Rene Benko and Cigna Group, don't we? Funny thing happened back in October. Cygnus offices were raided by the Austrian police. They seized laptops, hard drives, mobiles, documents. Why? Investigating political corruption. Emails between Braun and Benko were located, but that really wasn't the big problem. Braun and Marsalek were tight with former Chancellor Sebastian Kurt, as was former Minister of Finance Thomas Schmid, who was also one of Kurtz's buddies who turned state's evidence. Now, you may remember the Ibiza scandal. The center of that investigation, Heinz Christian Straka, the former vice chancellor, had claimed that companies, Novomatic, go back to episodes 20, 24, 30, and big donors to the OVP and FPO political parties, those same folks, tying back to Braun Marsalek, the Austria-Russia Friendship Society, Sturman, that included Benko, too. And Benko, with his close ties to Dietenberger and Deserf and Sturman and Marsalek, it does raise some very interesting questions about just how deep Russia got into that country. Recall, Kurtz lost the chancellorship because of political meddling. Compromat indeed. And another funny thing about the same time period, also in the fall, just as these parliamentary discussions of Rise and Deserf message plot were kicking off, the head of Germany's cybersecurity agency, Arne Schoenbaum, was fired. Why? Because apparently he holds ties to Russian intelligence. Is there anything Wirecard touched that hasn't been compromised? Or is it that the corrupt and compromised just like to use Wirecard? More on the treason and espionage in forthcoming episodes. In the meantime, I've got more money laundering to cover timely chats about wirecard connections to cryptocurrencies, and so much more. That's it for today's episode. Thank you, listeners. Thank you, Tom. Always thank you, Compliance Podcast Network. You've been listening to Lies, Spies, Corporate Crimes, The Wirecard Saga. I'm Mikhail Ryder-Gordon. I'll see you back here. Same time, same place. This is Tom Fox. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Wirecard Saga. The Wirecard Saga is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. I hope you will join us again for our next episode.